Well, hey there, and welcome back to my channel. This, my name is Rusty, and this is my horror movie and heavy metal channel where I talk about my favorite horror movies and uh, movies in general and my favorite music in my two different series, Scream With Me and Rock With Me. Now, we have been on our Resident Evil journey where we have been going through the Resident Evil movies in preparation and celebration for the November release of the brand new Resident Evil movie. Hopefully, we'll get a nice ride out of that one as I have with this one. So now we're up to 2010's Resident Evil Afterlife. Not precognition, not before life, but after life. Okay. I don't know why I like showing off the boxes so much. Because they're mine. It's mine. It's all mine. That's why. So, um, Resident Evil Afterlife is the fourth in the sixth uh, series franchise. And it was directed again by Paul W.S. Anderson, who also wrote it, and it stars Mila Yavovich, Ali Larter, and Wentworth Miller, amongst others. And a lot of people started having problems with the series at this point. I personally did not. So we'll first uh, move on with story time. Yes, we always have story time here. And um, Afterlife opens with a very... Now remember, this movie was filmed for the 3D craze going on at the time. Piranha 3D and the little resurgence of 3D movies at, of the time. So it was filmed with that in mind. But um, I think it looks fine. But like most movies like that, you can tell when they were filmed for that kind of environment uh, initially. And uh, yeah, so... Uh, the movie opens, like I said, with a pretty cool, um, you know, all of the rain, the rain scenes, and the, uh, it was very cool cinematography, and it finally zones in on this one Asian girl who just out of the blue attacks a man in the street, at which point we are then introduced to the fact that we are in the Tokyo Hive. We are in the Umbrella Corpse Tokyo Hive at the time. And um, we get a voiceover where Alice recaps from the last movie, talking about how, you know, she was in Project Alice. Uh, you know, she was uh, working for the Umbrella Corporation, how an uh, incident occurred. And she was left to deal with the consequences as is the world and that is that there is an apocalypse in which everyone's been turned infected with the t-virus turned undead so we're going on from there um as we get introduced to the tokyo facility uh, facility we are introduced to this movie's bad guy you know there's always got to be the asshole and in this one, it's uh, Chairman Wesker. I keep always wanting to call him Weskla, but it's Wesker, like a cat's whisker, but it's Wesker. And so, yeah, that's uh, this one. And we have, um, starts out with these, you know, zones in on him. We realize that this is the Tokyo Hive. And um, here comes Alice down the rabbit hole. And uh, you remember from the last movie, she talked about the clones. So, I mean, it shouldn't have been too much of a surprise if you had not, um, unless you went and watched this movie or watched this movie without watching the previous ones. Because she made very clear that there was a gigantic room full of clones. So, here we go with that. Um, at first, you think it's just Alice, but that Alice gets killed. And there are two or three more appear, and we see what's going on. That there are a bunch of clones attacking the facility. They make it all the way down to Wesker and his little um, abode in the Central Command. And we pretty much, they pretty much don't leave any room 
uh, for doubt that this guy is like probably the soulist, soulless and soulist evil uh, villain so far in the series because he is just flat out nasty. <laughs> He is nasty. But um, that scene, I really loved that scene, the opening attack scene. Uh, there was lots of gadgets, lots of John Wick style flips and turns and very, very dramatic and very, very Matrix. This movie has a lot of that. It's got a lot of the Matrix kind of cinematography and it's very gamey. It's, it's very like a lot of the games that I played, like The Surge and Outca uh, Outlast and uh, Prey, and you know, just it's it's a very gamey movie, which makes sense since it's Resident Evil. But I, I I really didn't have a problem with that it being very gamey, and also you know, if there are people that talk about its Matrix type cinematography, well, I don't have a, I don't have much of a problem with that either because I like that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, I like the Matrix slow mo, and this movie has a lot of slow mo. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool. Have you ever, do you ever like when you're watching movies like that, you feel like stopping as well? Like if I'm watching the movie and, and the scene starts and everything just suddenly stops, you go slow mo as well. I don't know why <laughs> it's just that I do whenever it runs in so like I, I watch half you know at least half of the running time of this movie is me sitting going wow look at that <laughs> because I feel like I've stopped in time with them which is kind of cool but then again I'm an absolute nutcase so there you go so after um, the big initial Tokyo scene, Wes, Wesler, Wesker escapes and is headed out and um, Alice appears on the plane and he shoots her up with um, what he calls um, an, sort of an antiviral agent that removes all of her powers um, because she's the real one and she causes the plane to crash and that's an interesting scene. That's I think kind of kind of one of the disjointed things about the movie is because I really, for the rest of the movie, I mean, you don't really see any difference in her behavior. She continues to act like an absolute total badass, so it doesn't seem like she's been reduced that much, but I guess if you really pay attention, you know, some of her powers do seem to be decreased a little bit, but she's still the superhero of the movie, you know, regardless of what that, but I think that's one of the little disjointed things about the movie, is that she doesn't seem to be that different, you know, in, um, after having received that, despite the fact that she thanked him before the plane crashed, um, for making her human again. So after she escapes from this situation, she continues on her journey. If you remember from the last movie, that journey was looking for Arcadia. Arcadia was this place uh, up north, which uh, supposedly um, was virus-free and where the survivors were gathering. So she is doing that. She ends up making it up there um, to where the coordinates are, to where this place is supposed to be only to find out that there's no one there. It's just like this giant collection of planes. It looks like an airport. And there's nobody there except, you know, and she begins to worry that maybe she is the only person left alive. So um, she films a sad little uh, thing on her camcorder where she talks about how, you know, she didn't know how much longer she could do this and she was afraid that she was the last person alive. Now, um, it was at that time that we see somebody come by and she tracks her down and traces her down and they end up having a fight only for you to realize that it's Claire from the last movie. You know, so Claire is there 
and um, that is you know pretty cool um, but she's got this metallic spider looking thing on her like right here in her chest and um, Alice manages to knock her out get it off of her keep her tied up uh, to realize that she has no memory of who she is or where she is so she keeps her tied up while they get back in her plane because she's kind of heartbroken now but hey at least she got somebody that she knows and she's just going to go down the west coast uh, I guess just on a search to find if anybody else is alive during this time of course Claire is coming back she is um, you know Alice has to tell her who she is that she remembers her and her memory starts to slowly return and when they get to LA that is when they fly over this what looks like a fortress it's actually a prison a giant prison complex so uh, they fly over it realize that there are survivors there non-infected survivors so we have this cool scene where Alice manages to land the plane so she manages to land the plane and we are introduced to several of our main characters Luther Angel um, Decker total asshole his little friend Kim um, and um, the chick I can't remember her name there was a, a chick in the movie um, Casey she plays Crystal yeah so there is a uh, crystal so you know you're introduced to all of them you're, you're still kind of wondering like what happened to the rest of the crew you know so it turns out that it's a prison and they're all thinking that she's from Arcadia uh, or that she's came from Arcadia yeah to try to help them and she's like there is no Arcadia only to have them explain to her that Arcadia was never a city and you know Arcadia was never a town Arcadia is actually a ship and they take her and they show her the ship offshore and it even has the name on the side so um, Alice learns that this mythical place is not a myth but it's also not a city it's not a town it's a ship that is offshore so she's like well that must be what they've been doing is staying offshore I guess kind of like that TV show the last ship which I love I've got a bunch of series I got three or four of the seasons I want them all it's like for some reason the last season is extremely expensive maybe the last two seasons I don't know but I've at least got three seasons I love the last ship but that's kind of what it reminded me of um, they're staying offshore and picking up survivors is what it looks like the Sun's coming out in Florida go figure um, but uh, so yeah um, get I remember most of this I just watched it so I'm like skipping through my notes um, so yeah Arcadia is a ship and meanwhile we did see we're introducing to a new kind of infected kind of like Cthulhu with uh, stuff coming out of their mouth the tentacles and and stuff like that and we see big boss daddy game, you know, game level, boss level daddy coming down the street. I could just call him the executioner. Um, he is a big old critter, you know, big old critter. I guess you could imagine like Kane Hodder or something being turned into an infected, and there you go. But um, I don't know what kind of creature this is. They never show it. But you can tell that's going to be one of our bosses, uh, boss level fights. And... Um, they take her uh, they take Alice down to um, this underground level where there where she is introduced to Chris now Chris is um, tells her that he is not a prisoner um, because when Luther and all of them took over this facility Chris was already down there in a cell sort of like Hannibal Lecter and they assume that he's some kind of killer or something to be in there when he tried to tell them that no he was part of a paramilitary um, staging in this prison and that when the, the prisoners were let go as some kind of joke you know as retribution they put him in that cell that he's really not 
um, supposed to be in it. But, you know, so he tries to convince Alice of this. Meanwhile, Claire comes down, um, and Alice uh, at first doesn't let him go, but as things start to heat up, she figures that he's the only one who has claimed to know where a, uh, a way out of this situation is because they're being breached. They're being breached from the underground. You've got Boss Daddy outside. So they go down there and they let Chris go. When Chris sees Claire, he tells her that she, you know, that he is her brother. Well, you know, there you go. So Chris and Claire uh, Renfield, I guess, or Hemfield. I know these names don't really matter, but they do to me. Redfield, yeah, there we go. Chris and Claire Redfield. So he tries to tell her that. She still doesn't remember him, but then again, she's still getting a lot of her memory back. And she does have a couple flashbacks in which she tells them, or tells them, the group, that um, she actually remembers now being at that place with all the planes in Alaska, and she remembers boats coming up, and she remembers them slapping that silver spider on her and um, her managing to get away before it took hold and they had left and that's how she ended up up there along so we kind of get an answer to that question meanwhile they've got to get the hell out of there so they let Chris out who informs them that there's this sort of like gigantic uber military ATV type vehicle that um, they could escape with through that to get to the beach to be able to get to the ship. So they're trying to prepare that. Um, him and, you know, Alice go down into the armory while the guys try to uh, get the door open to get into that vehicle. When they do get the door open to get into that vehicle, they find that the engine is not in it. <laughs> so. Uh, Decker ends up shooting Angel, which kind of pissed me off. That was rude. So he shoots Angel and kills him uh, so that Angel could not stop what he wanted to do, which was steal the plane. So this asshole Decker, whom I remember most, that guy, I remember him most as that psycho on the boat that runs into Kevin Costner in Waterworld. He was really good in that when he played that that crazy guy that uh, Kevin Costner runs into in Waterworld but he's a pretty well known character actor you can recognize him so you know he steals the plane which really pissed me off you know because he killed um, Then I was hoping he had crashed but he didn't so Alice and the gang um, are left to try to figure out another way to get out they realize well you know they can go through the underground into the sewers which would lead to drain pipes and all drain pipes end up at the beach so that's their plan to get out and um, do we lose anybody well at this point you know they they manage to get out but before they start the little journey we have big mm -hmm. boss fight number one and that is the executioner has gotten into so as the other people have already went down into the hole, Crystal and um, Luther and Chris have went down into the hole and right, you know, they're trying to get little Kim to go in there, but he's like acting all scared when all of a sudden he's cut in half by the big axe from the executioner. And here, you know, and that's the first thing that you kind of think when you see that happen is, oh, okay, well, here comes boss fight number one. And that's exactly what takes place. Um, Alice gets him going pretty good, but he knocks her out, and then, boom, Claire appears and shows her badass side. So between the two of them, they manage to get him and then um, get him down. He gets back up for one final time, and Alice has come back too. Which, remember, I was telling you that she didn't act a lot different, but I don't think she would have been knocked out if they hadn't have turned her, you know, neutralized those parts of the T-cell. So, um, that's what I meant by there is some scenes in which it does look like she has been reduced in her powers. So, um, Claire managed to finish up half the fight. You know, she did some, then Claire did some. Then she ended up doing the coup de grace and getting him with those wonderful shotguns. 
uh, the shotguns that shoot quarters. Those are, th I like that. <laughs> That's a cool scene. Uh, especially when they first introduced it, when they were attacked on top of the roof. Uh, that's when we first got to see the, the sh you know, the quarter shotgun that shoots uh, United States quarters. So that was pretty cool. So once they've defeated the executioner, they go on down. During this, they finally do meet up with Chris and them, and uh, we lose Luther. At this point in the movie, we have lost Luther as well. So we're, we've ended up with um, Claire and uh, Crystal and Chris and, um, yeah, is that all? Yeah, I think so. They managed to get onto a boat and get out to the ship. Now, when they get out to the ship, they find Decker's plane and they're like, um, so he did make it to the ship with the plane that he stole. And they're assuming that he is dead. Uh, because of the condition of the plane that is on top. Now, interestingly enough, when they do get down there, because the automatic message um, had stopped three, you know, three days ago, they find nobody. There's nobody there. Um, there's nobody on the ship, but everything's fine. Fuel, power, everything is going fine. There's just nobody on the ship. So they begin to look deeper and deeper into the ship and that is when um, they find the lower decks which looks like a giant lab and she starts understanding what's going on because the ship's manifest still claims that there's 2,000 people left on this ship but they can't find any of them and when they're down there looking for them Alice realizes that they're in the floor and she finds the control pads and everything and starts raising them up and it turns out that they're in these like cryogenic chambers and they all have the little silver spider on them. Now the first one that they wake up are, yeah, is Kmart. Kmart from the last movie. They find her and they get her off and they take the spider off and um, Alice realizes that something else is going on and she ends up being led to as she goes deeper into this little facility she finds a room goes in it the door closes and here we have Wesker and that's when you kind of know okay the executioner was just boss battle number one because Wesker's going to be boss battle number two. So Wesker proceeds to explain to her that the T cell, the T virus, has is what kept him alive after the plane crash. Only it grew in strength, and he's having to fight it for control. Um, which pretty much means he's trying not to turn. <laughs> um, he has all the superpowers, but he's trying not to turn, and um, he he thinks that ingesting her because of her DNA, because he's tried other human DNA. That's what he was doing. That's why his crew abandoned ship was because he started eating everybody, uh, trying to find a compatible DNA donor that would bond with the T-cell, and that's why he kind of led her here the whole time, was because he knows for a fact that Alice has the DNA required that can bind with the DNA. He thinks if he eats her, if he ingests her DNA, that he will be able to control the T-virus more and bond with it more instead of it trying to take him over. So we end up in, you know, the final boss battle, uh, which is Wesker and he does manifest creature abilities but he also manifests you know the the Cthulhu mouth you know and um, so we end up Claire and Chris have came in uh, where he finally admits to and 
if Claire had any doubt, she didn't have any doubt now because Wesker, you know, calls them Claire and Chris Ren uh, Redfield. And um, so any of her question that she had about whether this was her brother or not has been answered because she lets him know that that is indeed your brother. So they are brother and sister. And we have a nice Matrix style, of course, boss battle. And um, it's really good. And uh, they kick ass. The dogs were cool. Um, Wesker was cool as a boss, as a boss fight. So they get up. You know, they finally think they have him defeated. Which are actually some pretty gross scenes, you know, blowing half his head off and stuff like that. So, he manages to escape. So he thinks. And they, they did a good job, I think, in, you know, letting you think that he was escaping. Um, and was fisting to destroy the facility. And um, especially when Alice tells Chris and Claire to, come on, we've got to go. You think the facility's going to blow up, but instead she planned ahead, as she always does, and she had switched the facility purge bomb with a, you know, she had taken the facility purge bomb and put it on that escape ship that she knew he was going to take, or just in case he took it. And sure enough, he did, and they ran all up on deck, and that's when we got to see Wesker's escape shuttle explode like an atomic bomb. Now, is he dead for sure? We'll see, right? That's what the next movie is for. So, um, they revived all of the other things, and then we get a nice surprise, and that is Luther comes out of a drain pipe on the beach shoots a couple of infected that were following him and uh, throws a nice one-liner about you know that star power bitch uh, you know so um, he's alive and we didn't know that we thought he was dead so that was a little surprise at the end but then you see all of these transport shuttles come flying over him going out to the ship now you have all of these survivors standing on deck and Alice and Chris and Claire are standing on deck and they hear all of these shuttles coming and they're left standing there and Luther's left standing there and they're like, you know, what the hell is that? Claire and Chris are like, you know, what is that? Who, who is that? And that's when Alice tells him that that's trouble coming. So, um, the credits start to roll, that's it for that, and, uh, then they have, like, this post credit scene where you get to see Jill Valentine, you know, you wondered, like, where was she during all of this, because the show does say she's supposed to be there, and, um, so, when these shuttles are coming up, I was just making sure, yeah. Uh, when the shuttles were coming up um, at the end of the post, the post credit scene, you see Jill Valentine with a uh, silver spider on her and all of these commandos, these paramilitary commandos, as she is explaining to them that they are fissing to land on the ship and take the ship. Chris and Claire and Project Dallas are the main targets and that they she is unaware of how you know many other targets there are on the ship but those are the three main ones and does some smarmy little one-liner about you know they have no idea what's coming and that's the end of the movie so that's the way Afterlife goes and we can talk a little about you know I, I really love the cinematography in this movie as I said um, I'm not hard to please um, I have my I mean I'm a, I'm a complete cinemaphile I'm a complete movie nut um, as you will see in my October 
acquisitions. I I kind of went a little ape during Halloween season, I think, <laughs> because I got, I, you know, that video will definitely have some acquisitions to add to my collection for sure. But um, I'm, I'm not hard to please um, in general. I have my dislikes and there are things that annoy me just like everybody else has to but I'm, I'm pretty forgiving with a lot of things especially if I love it and it brings me entertainment because as I've said before in other videos I'm not a fucking critic I'm a fucking fan okay so I judge and criticize without being a critic I judge <laughs> I judge um, a movie as a fan, as a cinemaphile, as a fan, as a horror movie fan, sci-fi fan, whatever. I judge the movie from that. I'm not looking for something to bitch about. I'm not nitpicking, you know, to be an asshole. I'm sure there's lots of movies I don't like. There's lots of franchises I don't like. Um, but, you know... In the end, I judge a movie on its own merits. I, and you know, I investigate it usually before I see it. Who's in it? What's it about? What's the budget? Is it an indie? You know, because I, I judge things. My criteria for judging a movie is based on a lot of things. You know. Is it a bunch of unknowns? Is it stars? You expect more from, you know, I mean, if you watch a movie and it stars Jennifer Lawrence as opposed to someone you've never heard of, some brand new actor, you're going to expect more from Jennifer Lawrence. You're going to judge it a little bit differently because this is a well-known, established, Oscar-winning actress. Um, so you're going to be a little bit more unforgiving if it's shit than if it was a bunch of no-names indies that was filmed for $100,000 as opposed to a high-budget film that was filmed for $100 million. You know what I'm saying? You have to be logical about these things, and I, I do. I'm not going to judge um, movies unfairly. Uh, I've seen a great deal of movies that I watched that I saw were filmed for 50,000 or 100,000 or half a million um, indie projects and I found them fantastic and wonderful and they thrilled me to death and um, you know I don't have any problem with that and then I've seen 300 you know 150 million budget movie that I thought was absolute shite and of course I I judged it in a different manner but yeah so I mean you know my judgment of a movie is based on a lot of different criteria I unlike a lot of people I did not mind the um, you know this movie afterlife isn't an 8.5 or a 9.5 like the first two were and it wasn't an 8 like the third one was it's like a, you know, my score for this is 7.5. I really love this movie. 7.5 out of 10 is really good, you know. So I want to make sure that just because, you know, I judge it 7.5. What did I do on International Movie Database? I usually judge up. So if it's 7.5 to me on International D Movie Database because it doesn't have half points, I will usually give it an 8, um, unless it didn't have, you know, unless it actually deserved a 7. Um, if it's a low 7.5, I might give it a 7. If it's a high 7.5, I might give it an 8. So, you know, that's the way it is. But 7.5 is really good. I really did love this movie. It seemed a little disjointed in places. And it was very, very niche. And by that, I meant that this is a gamer's movie. And this is uh, a Matrix-style movie with a lot of cinematography that was, you know, aimed at that. And also aimed at 3D. So, um, but I loved the cinematography in this movie. And I did not have issue with the direction that the franchise took. I like the storyline. 
Um, even if a couple of the entries like this one seem a little empty of plot and more geared towards stunning visual action scenes and um, that's why it gets a 7.5 you know is because it's not perfect but it's perfect to me and it's a perfect installment in uh, the franchise telling an overall arcing story because you know the next movie picks up with the attack on the ship so it really is an overall story and afterlife is a perfectly fine um, enjoyable as a matter of fact I'm fixing to replace this uh, my DVDs uh, this one skipped in one place and then I like took it out and cleaned it off with alcohol and it didn't skip so I guess it's all right maybe it just had a smudge on it or something but in any event I did look up and find, because this reminded me of the franchise, I did look up and find that there is a complete box set with all six movies in it that you can get for less than 20 bucks on Blu-ray. You can get, you know, I can take this whole franchise on eBay and buy the whole franchise on Blu-ray and a Blu-ray box set for less than 20 bucks. So I'll probably, because this is a franchise that I love, I'll probably be doing that. I'll probably replace my DVD collection and give them away in a contest or something. A uh, box of movies contest. Um, if anybody ever wants to participate in a contest uh, for a box of movies, because I've got a whole bunch I could send out um, that I've replaced with Blu-ray or replaced for various reasons. And I have the other copies like all the Predator movies, um, all the Alien movies, um, stuff like that I've replaced with Blu-ray because, and I love the picture of Blu-ray when I did get a Blu-ray player, uh, the picture was so beautiful, but also DVDs, you know, they're not as shitty as VHS tapes, which can get fucked up real easy. Just one gnaw in a VHS, a VCR, and you're fucked. <laughs> but uh, DVDs, I, I take very good care of them. But even if you do take very good care of them, DVDs wear out faster, like 10 to 15 years, 20, 10 to 20 years. Um, and Blu-rays are a lot harder to scratch. They're a lot harder to mess up. And um, so, yeah. Why did I even get on that tangent? Because we're talking about movies. That's why. Um, so yeah, I love this movie. It's a 7.5 out of 10 to me. I, unlike some, do not have a problem with the direction that it's going. I like the storyline. Um, I like the acting. I like the cheesy Matrix special effects. Um, it's just a nice comfortable movie you know it's a comfortable franchise for me so I loved it very much and thank you for tuning in and uh, talking about it with me you can let me know what you think about this entry in this franchise good or bad and um, yeah Resident Evil Afterlife released in 2010 originally for 3d um, but I love it just the way it is. So yeah, a little thin on plot, but a continuation of the story. And I like those special effects. And so, you know, I like the direction of the movie. So yeah, 7.5 out of 10. Let me know what you think. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me rant on about Resident Evil Afterlife. <laughs> and um, I will see you in the next one. Love you, miss you, bye. And um, I appreciate your views. Um, I appreciate your opinions and talking. And I will see you in the next one. Keep screaming. Stay scary. And keep screaming when appropriate.